Our second reading for today comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 13. This chapter is a highlight of 1 Corinthians. In many ways, it draws upon much of what we have in Paul began his letter to the Corinthians, reminding them that the foundation of their faith and life together is Christ crucified. Their life together as a church is built on that solid rock and thus should be marked by humility and common purpose, forgiveness, and love. Yet the Corinthians are struggling with how to apply this good news of the gospel to their lives, both within the church and outside. Two particular topics that Paul addresses are sexual immorality and whether or not one should eat meat sacrificed to idols. And he generally argues that Christians enjoy freedom through Christ crucified, but that freedom should be limited by the law of love, so that our brothers and sisters in Christ might not fall back into a life of sin. In sum, all that we do in the large moments, the small moments of life, all should be done for the glory of God and with love for others, because that is what Christ did for you and for me on the cross. Now, while we should seek to do all for the glory of God every moment of every day, there are moments and times when Christians gather together to do so, and that time is worship. At the beginning of chapter 11, Paul turns to questions about the church's gathering, and he affirms the importance of both women and men in leadership of the church. He also does not commend the Corinthians for the way they eat together. Last Sunday, we heard Paul turn to spiritual gifts, a chief concern, and how these charismata, these great to praise the Lord. However, in Corinth, these spiritual gifts are instead tearing the church apart. So as we reach chapter 13, we see that Paul lifts up a gift that he has mentioned before, the gift of love, as essential for all spiritual gifts. Now to tie chapter 13 together with with which comes before and after, we're going to begin our reading today with the last verse of chapter 12. We're going to read over as well into the first verse of chapter 14. So let us hear then this word of God. But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known." And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. Pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Over the course of this summer, my children have started recording and watching reruns of the late 1980s and early 1990s television sitcom, Full House. I remember watching the show occasionally during its original run, so it has been fun for me to reconnect with this show through the eyes of my children. Full House is the story of the Tanner family. Danny Tanner is the widowed father of three girls. And he enlists his best friend and his brother-in-law to help him to move in so that they might help him in raising these three girls. Well, this past week, I happened to sit down as the kids were watching an episode about love. And the oldest daughter, DJ, is 15. She has fallen in love for the first time. And her father is quite upset by this turn of events, particularly as he sees her grades fall, her wardrobe change, and she seems to be giving up her dreams. So he forbids her from seeing this boy. And as you can imagine, she does not react well. However, in true sitcom fashion, all is well by the end. Because Danny realizes that he himself has fallen in love with a woman he's been dating. And that allows him to remember how it feels to be a teenager in love. And so the final scene has Danny and DJ reconciling over their shared experience of being in love. The dialogue goes something like this. DJ's asking the questions and her dad responds. She says, this being in love is kind of overwhelming. Do you feel lightheaded? Definitely. Is your heart pounding? Like a bongo. How about your stomach? Feels like I'm going to hurl. DJ smiles. It's the best, isn't it? Danny smiles and the screen fades to black as they hug one another. Yes, that kind of fuzzy, lightheaded, heart-pounding, stomach-churning emotion is how love is so often depicted in sitcoms and movies. And initially, in relationships, those feelings and emotions do threaten to overwhelm us. Unfortunately, those same emotions are the same emotions we feel as if you're getting ready to jump off the high dive at the Olympics for the first time or take the SAT or maybe even stand up in front of a congregation and preach a sermon. Yes, that full house kind of emotional love, it just bears so little resemblance to the love that Paul talks about in this chapter as a spiritual gift, a more excellent way for the people of God. Yes, this more excellent way, or another translation, the high mountain pass. This is nothing less than a description of Christ's love for us on the cross. Remember that Paul has suggested from the beginning of the letter that the foundation of the Christian community and its essential proclamation is Christ crucified. So it should not surprise us that when he begins talking about the essential spiritual gift, Paul uses Christ crucified as his reference point. For on the cross, God shows us what love looks like. And it's not just sweet and innocent. No, God shows us what love looks like by giving his son to a horrible and cruel death on the cross. Jesus asks for a drink of water and receives vinegar instead. 
upon his head a crown of thorns. Those whom he loved and had called to follow him had fled for their lives. And in a mystery only God can explain, Jesus even knew total abandonment, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, this love of God is far from simple and sweet. A wooden cross, nails in his wrist and his feet, a sword piercing his side, and yet still he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It does not end there. A body dead, prepared for burial, wrapped in cloths, laid in a tomb. And yet there's more. An early morning visit, the stone rolled away, fear and terror, a message of good news. That is how we know God loves us. God shows us love, and it is a love at great cost and personal. Yes, perhaps you have heard it before, but it is worth hearing again. Say the word love from 1 Corinthians 13 and plug in Christ instead. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have Christ, I am a noisy gong or have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. If I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have Christ, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have Christ, I gain nothing. Christ is patient. Christ is kind. Christ is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Christ does not insist on his own way. Christ is not irritable or resentful. Christ does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Christ bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, ends. Do you see that Paul is holding up for us, even without explicitly calling him by name, the one who is love, Jesus Christ, as the model, the essential foundation for the church? It really does not matter what spiritual gift you have, Paul says, because they are all important. But if you do not have Christ, if you do not have love, you gain nothing. And according to Paul, the Corinthians had become so focused on ranking their own spiritual gifts that they to love, and thus they have nothing. You see, this chapter is not just a beautiful hymn to love. It's also a critique of the Corinthians as they gather together. They are to love one another, be Christ to one another. And once we begin to recognize that critique, it also calls into question our own practice as we gather And we have to admit that loving as Jesus loved is an awfully tall order indeed. Pastor and educator Mark D. Roberts tells the story of a time in his ministry when he was working with a group in the midst of a conflict. And he writes, he says, The arguments were fierce, tempers flared, people were showing selfish attitudes that seemed so unlike what we're called to in Scripture. And finally, I said to the group, friends, I'm hearing what you want to do in this situation, but my question to you is, what do you think Jesus would do here? And one woman burst out in anger, I don't care what Jesus would do, I am not Jesus. Roberts continues, part of me wanted to respond, well, that's obvious. But by God's grace, I did not pour even more fuel on the fire of her selfish anger. In fact, I did admire her ironic honesty, I've got to say. 
But it almost seemed to me as if she was saying that since she wasn't Jesus, she didn't have to act. It's just not adequate for a Christian. A better statement would be, it's really hard to be like Jesus because I'm not Jesus. But I know I'm called to be like him, as tough as it can be. So Lord, help me. Help me be like Jesus. My friends, as we as here at Reed Memorial seek to be the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, may that be our prayer as well. I am not Jesus. You are not Jesus. But I know that we are called to be like him as tough as that can be. So Lord, help us. Help us be like Jesus. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, I'm not Jesus. This congregation, together, we are not Jesus. We know that we are called to be like him, as tough as it can be. Lord, help us. Help us to pursue Christ, to run after love on that high mountain path. For we have a desire to be like Jesus. Help us to love. Help us be like Jesus. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.